This episode is brought to you by Summer School Electronics. With pedals like the Snow Day Delay, the Pep Rally Fuzz, the Trash Panda, and my personal favorite, the Science Fair, which is two classic dirt pedals in one with a mid-boosted overdrive on one side, a black lab rat circuit on the other, and a blend knob to blend between them to find the perfect classic stacked dirt sound you're looking for, it's hard not to find something you'll love. Mark builds all of his pedals by hand in Syracuse, New York, where he also works as a full-time educator. In addition to the super fun graphics on their pedals, Mark also offers custom artwork. Want your dog's face on a pedal? He can do it. Want your face on a pedal? He can make that happen too. Go over to summerschoolelectronics.com and make sure to tell them that 40 Watt Podcast sent you. Hello again, 40 Waters of all shapes, sizes, and all over the place, wherever you might be. Welcome to another episode of the 40 Watt Podcast. My name is Philip, coming at you again. Uh, Going to take care of our housekeeping at the beginning, as is my tradition. Uh, remember to go to our website, 40wattpodcast.com, or our Linktree account, Linktree slash 40 Watt Podcast. Um, that link tree is weird. It's linktr.ee. I know you'll figure it out. You're very, very intelligent people. I know that you got it. Um, be sure to, all of our links are there. Go to our social media, do the like, subscribe, thumbs up, comment, whatever the appropriate societal response to that social media is, please do it. Um, also, if you really enjoy the podcast, remember to go over to patreon.com slash 40 watt podcast, where for as little as $3 a month, you can support this podcast. And at the same time, you can support a pretty awesome charity. I give 25% of my Patreon receipts at the end of the year to uh, a charity this year. That charity is going to be St. Jude Children's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, next year, who knows? I haven't really decided yet. I'm going to figure that out. Um, but so we've got a $3 tier. That's our lowest tier that gets you access, gets you special privileges on our discord server that we have that you can join for free, but you get some special privileges there. And at $5 a month, uh, you will get extra content every week, bonus content, sometimes with, uh, my podcast guests. Sometimes you'll, it'll be me and someone else who knows what's going to happen. Uh, it could get weird. It could be awesome. It could be terrible. But you'll never know if you don't go to our Patreon and join at the $5 level. At the $50 level, I will give you my time, and we will do lessons if you're crazy enough to give me $50. I mean, that's insane. That So it, it may just be that I psychoanalyze you at that point. So um, all that aside, I want to welcome uh, to the podcast Matt of Fidelity Guitars. I'm really excited Matt was able to... Uh, uh, come all the way from Cambridge to uh, Mississippi via the wonderful technology of the internet. Matt, how are you, sir? Well, good, man. Yeah, it's Friday evening here. That's uh, you picked a good time. Yeah, Friday Friday afternoon for me. For those of you that uh, are curious, we are recording this the Friday before it will be released. So, uh, if there's news that happens between right now and when this is released, I apologize for not talking We're not about it. Not to blame in any way whatsoever. Exactly, it wasn't us. <laughs> So, Matt, uh, I became aware of your guitars through Joe Branton. So just go ahead and give him a little credit where credit's due. Um, yeah. Joe talks incessantly about fidelity to guitars. And so yeah, he's, he's, he's been amazing. He's, he's probably one of the first people sort of outside of, sort of my close circle of friends to kind of cotton on to the fact that that was building anything. So it's <laughs> just been like years now where he's been he's been sort of um, – Give me a shout out whenever possible. And that's, that's, that's amazing. So yeah, big, big thank you to him. Yeah. And, and so he talked about them incessantly enough that I started checking them out and I was like, okay, why is he so jazzed up about it? And, and I get it as someone who is a, uh, roots blues musician, grew up in the Mississippi Delta. Um, the vibe your guitars give off, it feels familiar. It, 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 now I've never actually held one in my hands. Obviously there's probably not a ton of them in the States yet. I don't actually know. Yeah, it's funny. There's a few. I mean, we're still working on setting up um, dealers and stuff, and, and hopefully, sort of next year, we'll get back into that. We kind of had plans for that pre-COVID, and kind of understand. But um, yeah, we'll get back around to that. But outside of the UK, probably US is about half of half of the guitars against the US at the moment. 
which oh, is wow. which is amazing which is cool yeah and it's bizarre to me considering how many uh, amazing builders you guys have got over there that um that, that people are sort of coming to to find me in, in cambridge to then send guitars out to the to the u.s so that's that's really cool yeah no that's that's really crazy it, it's such a it's such a cool thing to see as the the music industry has grown especially in the small builders uh uh mm-hmm. just First of all, the distribution that's possible now, you know, there's always been small builders. There's always been that that guy in Kansas City or that guy in New Orleans, Louisiana, or that guy in Orlando, Florida, who builds guitars and maybe everyone within like a fi- – every guitarist within like a 50-mile circle knows who they are. And they build yep. guitars for all the players in the area or maybe they build amps or maybe they're a pedal builder. They've always – there's always been those guys. I can I can – the names are gone because my memory is trash, but I, I can distinctly remember three or four amp builders in the Memphis, Tennessee area that like everyone in Memphis had one of those guys amps. Yeah. yeah. And and they talked about yeah. how amazing they are, but nobody ever saw them. We're now. No. Yeah. We're really lucky to be sort of trying to, trying to do a building and, and, and trying to sort of build brands of businesses in, in this age, I think where you can just stick something up on, on YouTube or Instagram and, yeah, it's, it doesn't matter where you are. It's gonna go. It's gonna go around the world. It's um, that's pretty cool. I, I know what you mean about sort of the the local builders thing. It was like over here. There's a lot of strats or and telly <laughs> copies from like the the 90s and early noughties knocking around. Like just north of here, there's in Yorkshire, there's a few towns called like Tadcaster and Doncaster, <laughs> and there's a lot of uh, like Fender Doncasters that you'll find. And yeah, so it, but um, yeah, it's. It, it feels like being able to sort of do those shapes, which aren't sort of the traditional shapes, and, and get those out to people is is the thing that's become easier. Yeah, in particular, you know, it's um, the Strat has been on my brain this morning because um, uh, that pedal show put out a show this morning about Strats, like it was all about <laughs> Strats, and uh, excuse me, um, they had this, they just made this comment about how uh, all the like. A lot of the guitar heroes played strats, right? And then Mick made the comment. He said, I, and they were like, well, why do you think that is? Blah, blah. He said, Jimi Hendrix. And so I was like, okay, that absolutely, you know, sure, Hank Marvin existed. Sure, Buddy Holly existed, but it was Hendrix. And I think if Hendrix had not picked up a strat, if he had picked up something else, we'd be talking about that guitar instead. You know, yeah, but the, and, and and the availability thing as well. Like you could see that, and then you could just go and get it. Yeah, it, it was it was a. It's the most you, bar none, the most ubiquitous, recognizable electric guitar on the planet. It is the most copied. It is the most, probably the most scrutinized. Sorry, Gibson, they got more scrutiny. Uh, you know, it's been the most, it's been the most like over analyzed instrument on the planet, and everyone has made one, you know? And so it's interesting to see your brand, bring it back around to to, you. You've got these, these funky, like sixties Japanese guitar aesthetics. Um, but very much its own thing. Like I'm, I'm pretty well versed in like the, the Tysco, the K, the silver tones, the airlines, all that stuff. Cause that all came through. We saw tons of that stuff in Mississippi in the 90s, early 90s, you couldn't give that stuff away. And now, of course, everybody wants it, but... Yeah, um, $10,000. Yeah. Yeah. The, the silver tones. like Not not those crappy, like, early 2000s silver tones, like, but, like, the original silver tones. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, they're, Maybe they're those amazing. 2000s they've, they've ones. They've got a certain, certain thing. And it's the same with... Um, so you get them over here, obviously, but it's the same with sort of old burns and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And you... Yeah, and like I've had sort of old sixties Burns Baldwin's the the similar sort of catalog style vibe, and and you you pull them apart and they're just like thrown together. They're not they're not well made, but they've just got that thing. There's a there's like a song in them. You know, there's a song in there somewhere, and like it's the it's the thing you can't buy, and that's yeah, that's totally the that's it. The thing for me is it's just yeah, it's got you got to look at it and 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 pick it up and 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 the song's got to come out of it otherwise it's not it's not it's not doing its job like it's not it's not performing as as that tool should should function and that's that's kind of where where sort of starting out immediately with the the different shapes came from it's like I, I, I love tellies in particular i've had strats and stuff but i don't i don't look at them and think you know it doesn't excite me i want to see something that's kind of 
catches my eye and, and inspires me in a slightly different way. And, and I think it's, it's re- equally as important as something inspires you visually as it does in the way it sounds and it, and it feels to play. hundred percent. I'm such an aesthetic player. I, 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 I have to like the way something looks or I won't enjoy it. I'm that way with amps. Yeah, so you're just not going to pick it up. Otherwise yeah. that's the, that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm that way with amps and guitars and just like, um, you know, I'll go to put something up for sale or trade and somebody offers me a trade that like, even if it like financially makes sense, even if it tonally, it's a cool amp. If I don't like the way it looks now, nah, I'm not interested. I don't want it. <laughs> yeah. no, it's true. And it's not that that's not like lowest common denominator or anything at all. Like if no. you, if you don't like it enough to pick it up, then you're not going to, you're not going to write on it. You're not going to play anything on it. It's, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's totally valid. And with yours, you've really, really thrown your hat in with like gold foils and Charlie Christian style pickups and some of that funky stuff that you know you used to only be able to get in those wilder, crazier guitars. Um, it yeah. seems to be pretty and standard the, the, for you. It's been sort of, um, I have to thank Mark at Mojo Pickups, who's um, sort of a pickup winder up in sort of Halifax, just north, just north of where I am. Who, who winds it all by hand, but he's put a real lot of effort into making sure that he he does sort of replicas of the the regular stuff, but a lot of effort into coming up with his own designs or, or t- sort of twists on on things like um, the Tyscope Gold Foils and Charlie Christians and stuff like that. Um, and so part of it is making the guitars look different by using a pickup that that doesn't isn't instantly familiar, but also it really helps that that all of his stuff sounds sounds great as well. But yeah, so coming back to the the the, the look of it again, sort of. I quite like to try and deceive what you expect the recipe to to throw out almost because like there's um I'm, I'm a total gearhead but there's a, a part of me that really doesn't like it when you analyze a guitar on the spec sheet and go oh it's gonna it's gonna do this it's gonna sound like this it's gonna play like this and so if you can put bespoke parts on their pickups that people aren't using it's really difficult to then sort of make a judgment on exactly what it's going to do before you've actually played it and that's that's kind of really important to me yeah i i don't know it's joe and i sort of talked about this when uh joe brant when he was on the podcast um it it also is like he talked about how uk brands are starting to find their i don't remember his terminology but i'm going to call it flavor does that make sense you know what i mean like yeah. american American small boutique makers, I think, are finding a common flair. You're seeing a lot of the offsets. You're seeing a lot of the uh, a lot of Firebird shapes coming out of mm-hmm. a lot of makers. I'm not going to call anybody out. I love all of them. I genuinely yeah. do. I, I I love the Firebird shape a lot. And I think uh, UK builders are starting to develop an aesthetic themselves. And and I think you're at least as far as I've seen, you're really at the forefront of that like. Funky, but modern, um, affordable. We're going to really talk about that here in just a second. Cause I think, I think the pricing of your guitars is some of the most incredible part of what you're doing. I try actually, no, I'm going to talk about it right now. I went on your website and I started to spec out guitars. I was just curious, how much do these things cost? And I think I spec'd out, I spec'd it to the nines, like every add on every extra expense and I think my top end came in at like thirty three hundred US dollars. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I just... can't get a custom shop strat for that. I, <laughs> I can't get most of Gibson's line for that. Yeah, you definitely can't get most of Gibson's line for that <laughs> not anymore. Um, yeah, I mean, part of that comes from. Uh, I always set myself like when started out was these aren't going to be more than three thousand sort of UK pounds that i'd prefer them not to be more than 2000 uk and they've, they've sort of crept up over over time but part of that's just because i wouldn't I, I can't imagine spending that much money on a guitar and that's yeah. that's just me but at the same time if that's if that's the case then i can't reasonably justify asking other people to 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 do the same regardless of sort of the amount i totally understand the amount of time that goes into it and material costs and stuff like that um so yeah that's that's where it started out and then part of what i'm doing is is then building to that budget um and and trying to find ways to do that and obviously still make a a, a living off of it because this is my full-time job so right. it, have to, it has to be profitable at the same time um 
and to do that sort of there's there's little ways that you can save money in terms of making my own parts or, or designing my own parts and sort of bulk ordering and stuff like that things like the finishing so you can't have one that's not a relic and part of that is it's kind of threefold one is just like the way that the relics look so two there's a something i'm trying to remove a fear factor from someone who's just bought like their maybe their first custom shop guitar and they're, they're maybe afraid to play it in the way that they should and, and attack it in yeah. the way that they should in case they put a ding on it so i'm quite happy to put at least a, a ding on it probably <laughs> more just to get rid of that and, and let you let you play um and then the other part of it is it makes it a, a big time sink for for builders i think but if you're finishing in nitro is trying to get a flawless nitro finish because it's just really really hard to do um consistently and it takes it takes a lot of time um more than anything it just takes time to to keep going and make sure it's flawless so if i can kind of skip that a little bit then it saves me a bit of time and i can pass that on in terms of the the actual sort of list price of the guitars yeah um and then yes of the 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 cheaper end of the scale was just came out of last year and, and sort of going into lockdown and sort of thinking about particularly musicians being pretty much completely out of work for the foreseeable future but still trying to get these guitars out to people who who wanted something to play um and so started doing a, everything up to that point had been chambers ash and uh, and at that point started doing solid first line of solid bodies that i'd ever done and um and, and tried to get them in under under a thousand pounds yeah so. which is insane it's it's completely bonkers and like looking over your line like every aesthetic is so unique to you i i don't I like sure I see some influence and I see some ideas, but but nothing is nothing is a copy. Like even straight down to your vibrato systems look unique. Mm. They're they're uh, I believe it's a custom plate you've got on top of the vibrato. It's wild. yeah, that's right. So it used to be um the the Fender offset trem, and then now it's um Chris Wope's Descendant um trem, and very very kindly he's uh I kind of we talked a bit before because I'd bought some some parts of him before. Um, but I said, like, I really want to use this on, on the guitars, um, but make it fit with my aesthetic rather than being sort of wedded to the the, the fender shape, sort of the fender offset shape, shape plate. Um, so I kind of just designed it and told him, this this is it, is that okay? <laughs> and very graciously, he, we um, we worked out and he said, yes. So that that's kind of the the standard on, on all of the guitars now. But yeah, just like you say, again, just to make sure it fits. I don't understand why does it have to be that that fender plate? It doesn't have to be that place. It's, it's yeah. we're really lucky that we can sort of access sort of small batch manufacturing in a way that you can now that wasn't necessarily available even sort of five years ago, ten years ago, um, and, and do stuff like that. So wherever I, wherever I can, I, I definitely will try and make bespoke parts. Yeah, because you know originally builders had to, especially small builders, just were they were beholden to whatever was available in the market. You know, they didn't mm. have access to people who could make this new and funky shape, this new and funky design. And so unless you were like an artisan builder who was building like one guitar a year and you were willing to devote, you know, three months of that time to, you know, making these custom uh, metal parts and and tuners or whatever it is you're making, you were beholden to what was available at the mass market, you know? Yeah, that's it. And and it's not easy. If you're like trying to turn metal and and cut metal, it's like you need, you need a shop, you need a special specialist shop for that. Like I can't do that. My my shop's up for woodwork, but I wouldn't. But you know, I can do a little bits of fiddling around with metal. I would not want to try and make like a bridge from scratch. But I'm um, very lucky that that sort of say with the bridges in our town, there's a there's a CNC sort of milling and laser cutting shop just a mile down the road that, oh, that can do that for us. So. Yeah, it makes it much much easier to to put that out. So, um, with your guitars. Uh, in, in listening to clips, and you've got a couple of signature artists. You make a signature guitar for them. I, I noticed on the website. Uh, I was not aware of that. You know, um, Joe didn't go into that kind of detail. He's too busy talking about the ones he's commissioned. <laughs> which he just got guitars for his entire band, which is fair. yeah. That, that was really, it was really cool, and it, the, it was nice in all of them because they all had um, so all his guitars had something unique about them. But they're they're all slightly or about half of them a bit more sort of modern than I would normally lean to. So polished polished parts and stuff like that um and it was nice it's nice just to be able to sort of lean into the the sort of the template that i've built and then twist it in different ways and that's where all the 
the best stuff comes from. That's where new models come from and variation stuff is, is always from customers saying, like, mm, could you do this or that, that that wouldn't normally be sort of my thing, but mm-hmm. then takes it somewhere else that, that you then realize, like, ah, like, yeah. It's that yeah. eureka moment that, that only comes through sort of collaboration, connection with other people. It's paid research and development right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just the best kind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's not that like there, the the boom and sometimes I stumble over my words like I did just then. Uh, but there's this really cool thing, like for example, I just bought. You were talking earlier about the nerve wracking of buying a custom shop guitar and then being scared mm. of dinging it up. And like I bought my very first, I don't know, custom. I'm going to put it in air quotes. It's it's pretty much custom. You know, I chose what I wanted on it within some parameters. I bought a Novo, um, Saris J. I love that guitar. I absolutely yeah. But it's, it's kind of my dream guitar. Yeah, and there's a big, big sort of influence from um, from Dennis there. And, yeah. and sort of when I got started, there was yeah, that was a, a big one for me to try and get somewhere close to to the kind of style that he was doing. Yeah, but and, sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, oh no, you're you're absolutely fine. Um, but yeah, that's the idea. Is that? But then there was that nerve wracking, like the I I knew what I wanted. I designed what I wanted. No one else had ordered one from them in the aesthetics that I wanted. You know what I mean? And so, but it also, the last time I had played one was 2016 at Chicago Music Exchange, right? Last time I had one in my hands. Mm -hmm. And there's that moment where you make your deposit. And I was like, oh God, am I going to hate it? Am I going to get this guitar (laughs) and I'm going to hate it? But, you know, I didn't have to worry about the aesthetic thing because it's also pre-relict. And so I'm like, actually, I heard... (laughs) So I'm in, I'm in a, I'm in a Novo group on Facebook and someone today in the group had mentioned they had sold one of their Novos. They had multiple, so they sold one and the buyer wrote back and complained that there was (laughs) extra scratches that he was sure were not from the factory on his already relic guitar. (laughs) Um, what? That's just not the right. Yeah. That's not the right home for that guitar. It's not. It really isn't. <laughs> it just needs to go somewhere else. Yeah. yeah I just. Yeah. And was, yeah, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. What are you I'll, see? I, I play guitars. I don't. I don't like to baby them. I. I yeah. Exactly. It's no, a tool. It's, a, it's a tool. It's a creative tool. It's um. It's yeah. It's nice to look at them. Like it's nice to have the the rack on the wall behind you, or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's but yeah, yeah. Unless you actually like yeah exactly. <laughs> unless you actually like making music with them then and what's the point and if you're and if you're worried about yeah about dinging it up then then you, you're yeah. not going to play the best music that you can exactly like i bought a um i think i've talked about this on the podcast in 2019 when gibson changed ceos and the ceo went in and was like all right here's the first thing we're doing and they eliminated all the crazy dip switches and weird <laughs> finishes and they were like a les paul standard is a les paul standard solid wood four knobs, a switch and pickups. Right. And I was like, that's what I want. And then they dropped the price from like $3,400 down to $2,500. And I was like (laughs) that. Okay. Like I can buy a new one now for what used were selling for. And so, yeah. And you got such heritage. Like everyone knows what they expect a Les Paul to to sound and play like. So, right. Yeah. You're only going to be disappointed if it doesn't do that exact thing and it isn't that i don't want them to push boundaries but i don't want them to change their flagship model to push boundaries which is what they're doing now they've got a contemporary collection where they're going to try some new things and they're probably going to flop on some new things because let's be honest gibson players aren't the most adventurous players they're Mm -hmm. traditionalists i'm a traditionalist i get it um but like i bought that guitar it's gorgeous it's a beautiful guitar. When it got its first ding in it, I was like, finally. Okay. I don't have to worry about it <laughs> anymore. You can breathe. Yeah. Six months without breathing. Like yeah. I've got a, I've got a, where is it? The 137 custom. Right oh there. yeah. Amazing. Nice. I, that guitar. I like, I like the, um, the inlays on the, on the fretboard. Yeah. Like yeah. The, it's, the it's, an, split. it's an yeah. ebony with the split diamonds. Mm-hmm. It's really good. I love that guitar. I actually got it in a trade. I was looking for a semi hollow guitar because I play, I had the 135 that's behind me. Somehow I can point to it, but um, I had that. But a lo- it's right on the nose as yeah. well. That was that's well uh, practiced. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I'm getting better at this, looking at myself in reverse and pointing. But the 135 has P90s in it and it's noisy on some stages, really noisy on mm. some stages. So I needed something with humbuckers. 
I had a Les Paul at the time that I that was a great player, but semi hollow was my sound. Sort of still is. It's, it's it's a blues thing, but whatever. So guy offered me that as a trade. I love that guitar. I adore that guitar. But I'm going to tell a story that's going to give some people an aneurysm. So so those Gibson semi hollows, the strap peg on by the neck, it's not in a whole lot of wood. There's okay. not a whole lot of wood holding that strap peg. And if it strips out, good luck. Because there's no wood behind it. There's not, not like a big block of wood behind it because it's in that hollow section of the guitar. And wow. so once it strips so, so, out, it's a problem. I tried, so it's not, is, is it in the neck heel or is it? It's not in the neck there? heel. It's, it's, and that's the thing. It's like I'm going to pick up a Les Paul. So listeners, what I'm describing. Uh, so if you think about where the uh, strap peg is for a Les Paul, it's in a similar placement for those semi right, okay. And yep. so there's, it's hollow. Um, so it stripped out on me and I tried everything I tried, uh, cause I tried everything I could to fish like a block of wood up behind it using like fishing line. And so it give new wood pre drip the whole, I tried everything. I'm sure a legitimate luthier could have figured this out, but I couldn't afford a legitimate luthier and I needed it to play. Right. Yep. Well, we've established its tools to me, so I, <laughs> oh, I'm going to give somebody so mad at me. I went in, I drilled the hole out a little bigger, got an appropriate dowel, doweled it in, re-drilled, and once I got it drilled in, that strap, uh, <laughs> that strap peg is locked to it. Yeah, it's no, just, amazing. It's I don't think never you're that far off what a lot of luthiers would actually yeah. do. To it's, be honest, <laughs> that, I'm not changing that strap peg ever. It would have to break off, and then Genius. then we'll really figure something out. But um, <laughs> but you know that's a. I would have preferred it if the dowel sort of hung out the top of the guitar and just had a bit <laughs> of string like tied onto it. But oh yeah, well I wanted to hide it a little <laughs> bit here. <laughs> it is a beautiful guitar, but but it's again it's a tool and I needed to do a job. And if it isn't doing that job, or if I'm scared for it to do that job, then, you know, then- I, I need to move it on. Because it's not the right guitar for me. And that's another thing that I love about yours. Relic guitars are a big... ah, People get up in arms about them. Pre-relic guitars, but whatever. I I, I get it. it, it, Not everyone's the same. Everyone's got different tastes. It's just my perspective on it. Um, If you're not into it, I'm not going to be offended. (laughs) There's plenty (laughs) of other guitars out there. It's just that, yeah. That's kind of the way way my brain's wired on, on the subject, but... Yeah, and I'm I'm looking, and something you offer that guys like Novo don't yet. I, I hear there's talk and whisper, but you actually have a base model as well, the the Thundermaker. We'll be right back. This podcast is supported in part by String Joy Strings. I'm a snob, at least that's what people tell me. I'm never okay with good enough, and that's where String Joy Strings come in. They're better than good enough. They're the best. Stranger are making some of the finest strings available today right up the road from me in Nashville, Tennessee. They offer custom sets, balanced tension, coated strings, the works. If you need it, they can probably make it happen. You should be using Stringjoy strings, and if you're going to order from them, you really could help this podcast out by clicking the affiliate link down in the description or show notes below. You get amazing strings, I get a little bit of that back to help the show keep going. It's a win-win situation. Get your Stringjoy strings today. Yeah, so I, I'm really more of a bass player than I am a guitarist, to be honest. So whenever I was playing in bands when I was younger, I was, I was always the, the bassist, and I, and I kind of in, enjoy that more. I enjoy playing bass more than I enjoy playing guitar, if I'm honest. So, yeah, it was really important to do do a bass model early, um, and it's, it's quite old school. So it's my, my like, I had a Rickenbacker 4001 like V63 for a long time. It was like my main bass, so that was like the Paul McCartney Sit or semi signature kind of oh, yeah. four thousand and one with with high gains. Someone had, someone refinished it in tobacco sunbursts and thinned out the neck and put high gains in it and stuff. So it was, it was a bit of a a mongrel, but I just <laughs> love that. So I kind of went for that sound and got got market mojo pickups to to wind me like some custom high gains and stuff like that. But um, so yeah, that is it's not a modern like <laughs> no. funk machine like slap slap plastic no, bass. No, it's it's very much a like blow your trousers off kind of bass but like, that's what i like 
I love the I love the fact that the uh, the the model pictured on your website actually has the uh, pointer knob. <laughs> I, I don't know what that knob actually does because there's three knobs there, but it's got the. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the the pointers on on, on all of the guitars generally are um, uh, rotary pickup selectors. Oh, that's um, so cool! So, yeah, as sort of a, a rule of thumb, my my favorite sound is always the series mix. So running one pickup into the back of another to make a bigger, basically a bigga pickup, um, which comes from Dan Electro. So I always thought that was the best sound on Dan Electro. So yep. that that has to be like a default thing. So that's on the bass as well. And then there's also a toggle switch, which is just a two-way switch, um, which is a series mode bypass. So wherever setting the the pointers on, you can flip to the loudest sound available straight away from whatever other setting you're on. So it's kind of a oh. usability thing for for gigging. So it's kind of like your first chorus sound, or like, <laughs> in the case of the bass, it'd be a bass solo sound. <laughs> which maybe no one wants, but um, for the guitar, it's definitely sort of maybe a solo switch. Um, but yeah, and on the bass, that series mode is is like too loud. <laughs> like, it makes like roof tiles come down and stuff. But but I love it. So that's um that's kind of become the sort of standard layout on there. But yeah, that's that's what the pointers are. They're all they're all rotary selectors. Oh, that's very cool. So yeah, the name's appropriate then, Thundermaker. Once you flip that yeah. switch, <laughs> good luck. Well, so uh, I I play I play bass and guitar. I, I've done both for years. Um, because it's always just been a matter of whatever's needed, you know, whatever band. Because mm-hmm. I've been in bands, but I get calls to, hey, my, my bassist can't make it for this gig. Can you come play bass? Can you, you know, my guitarist can't make it for this gig. Sometimes only 20 minutes before the gig, I get the call. Um, I got a call once for a blues gig. Guy called me and said, uh, hey, uh, Mike can't make it. Can you come play? I was like, yeah, when? Uh, 30 minutes? I was like, what? Uh, playing for a guy named Razorblade at the time. Okay. Uh, like blade what he's like yeah we're, we're over here and i was like all right i'm on my way i show up i get my gear set up five minutes before downbeat he says oh yeah we're recording tonight for a live cd by the way <laughs> what <laughs> it sounds like my worst nightmare like, I'm, I'm no player so that that would absolutely terrifying oh, it so was... fair play for, for even yeah for not walking out the door oh yeah and and on top of that i was playing a guitar that I had just finished getting put back together. And I was like, Oh, I'll play this tonight. Cause it wasn't like a major gig. I was like, Oh, it'll be a good night to break this guitar in. It was a horrible night to pick, to break that guitar in. <laughs> so, and of course I didn't have time at that point to run and go get a different guitar, but it, it went, it ended up fine. The CD sounded great. Um, <laughs> through a very, very impressive feat of engineering. Um, <laughs> so, um, but, I over the years I drifted away from funky, but I love funky guitars and your guitars really, really like your guitars give what a lot of like, you know, like, uh, Oh, Eastwood is trying to do right. A modern take on those vintage classics, but they're very much just recreating the classic. Whereas your it's as if you came right out of that period when those funky Japanese guitars that all had their own unique character and unique funk and unique whatever feeling came right out of that. And then you added to it modern technique, modern playability, modern quality control, like custom shop quality into into something with a personality. I'm looking at all yeah, well, of you Strat th- cloners. Thank out you, there. man. Yeah, thank you. That's that's a massive compliment because that's kind of exactly what <laughs> I've been trying to go for. Um, yeah, it was at, like the, the the line in my head was always that like you you'd gone up into your, your granddad's loft and you'd found this, this dusty old case and it was some like forgotten Italian brand from the the sixties or seventies that that no one had heard of since and you dug it out and it was yeah so that that was it from a sort of a, a looks perspective. But then, then yeah, totally like a, a lot of those guitars um, are absolute like pigs to play like they're, they're horrible to play um so it was doing that whilst updating it and having like dual action truss rods or for the base having like graphite reinforcement and and stuff like that and just and compound radius and and, and things like that just those all like quality of life features that just make it actually a nice instrument to play because right. there's something to be said in sort of fighting with the guitar you can definitely get 
songs and sounds out of that that you wouldn't get if you didn't have to fight it but at the same time as sort of an everyday player and particularly again thinking about people who who maybe are just ordering the first custom guitar that you don't necessarily want to sort of get it and then have to to get in a big fight with it to get the best out of it it's got to be fairly sort of versatile and 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 reasonably slick to play without sort of being sort of a modern it's not it's not a modern shred guitar it's never going to be but to be comfortable yeah, and 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 they're they're not for shredders. You can look at them and, and tell that that's fine. They're yeah. I, I was going to say they're not pointy enough. There's there's a few points here and there, but it's not that kind of pointy. <laughs> it's I also I love your liberal use of tortoise shell. <laughs> I love it. Like I am tort is my it's my crack. It's my cocaine. I love it on every finish. I you know I don't care. I don't care what anybody says. I would put a tort pick guard on every guitar I've got if somebody did not stop me. Uh, in fact, I've- yeah, man, do it, do it. <laughs> it's, I- uh, it no, it's great. Uh, yeah, and it, there, there are definitely certain colors where it goes better than yeah. the, than others. And I try and sort of steer people if I don't think it's going to work. But generally, generally, sort of with a white or a pink, black, sunbursts, like you can put it on all of those. Um, so yeah, it's a. a, a it's a tricky one because you can't really you can get hold of sort of celluloid sheet like they had in the the 60s now but um it's it's expensive and quite hard to get hold of and also it's really dangerous yeah like it's, um, it's also not yeah, easy to work with from what i've heard either it's, no because it's quite soft so yeah. if you try and mill it or drill it then it's quite happy to like ball up into little bundles <laughs> of hot celluloid and then it's, like the first time i ever cut it on the cnc it was like my first year of doing this and like still learning a lot. I didn't really know what I was doing by that point. I had to hide behind like the, the machinery on the other side of the shop from the CNC while it was kind of a scratch plate because the, the celluloid sheet was just balling up around the, the bit, getting really hot and then exploding and flying across the, oh my God. the workshop. <laughs> There's these little hot fireballs just sat on the floor like, <laughs> uh, it was it was insane and uh, like horrific and incredibly unsafe and so yeah that <laughs> that doesn't happen anymore but that's that's a good reason not to try and cut celluloid um so yeah it's um i tend to use uh, acrylics now um that have a very thin celluloid like laminate inside so it's like clear and there's sort of a 0.1.2 mil thick bit of, of tortoise shell celluloid in between and then more clear acrylic okay. which is much easier to cut but the, the thing you have to do then is it's very see-through so i tend to paint the back of all the tortoise shell with oxblood nitro which is semi-opaque to give it more of a red hue and then i go over it again with metallic copper acrylic paint so it's, it's a bit of a that's sort of a labor process. of love it's a lot of work just to just to get your sheet sort of prepped before you even make the scratch plate out of it but uh yeah i'm, I'm with you it looks that was everything that's cool that was gonna shell, be my so. question about it was how you got that very like vintage red tort look. Uh, so yeah. it is, it's, it's a process because you know, you, a lot of the tort today, it doesn't look very good. It's, yeah, you, you, no, gotta, I agree. you gotta really look for good looking tort pit guards and covers uh, to find it, to look like that. Yeah. Cause the, the default thing you'll get is sort of the, the three ply sort of white, black, white or black, yep. white, black with then just a, a sheet, a printed sheet on the top that isn't, that isn't sort of celluloid and generally you can you can get it like that but it's generally just a, a photo of tortoise shell that's been stuck on on the top of it and it's, it, and and it, it's does, flat. Like, it, it doesn't look good because it's not 3d exactly yeah it doesn't have that 3d quality yours look like you can look straight through them uh which obviously you know with all the extra you really can't but they but you probably if you held it up to light you can see the light through it exactly yeah yeah, yeah that's it that's it and it, so the, yeah you have to do a bit of prep and and make it not quite so see through, so that you can't see pick up cavities and stuff like that, sort of hidden underneath. Um, if it's too see through, it doesn't look great. So yeah, it's definitely like you said, a a process. But yeah, it's all about getting that three D that three D thing into it. It's really really important. It makes a big big difference to me. Little little details like that. Yeah, uh, it it looks fantastic. So we've talked about the guitars, but um, actually, what I meant to ask on the top of this. But, you know, because my brain is Teflon coated and nothing sticks and I have to remind myself. So let's back up. What got you like what got you into music and then what got you into building guitars? Like what made you think, oh, I want to make my own guitars? 
yes um so music um not from a particularly sort of musical family but sort of it was always sort of a little bit of music there and around but i was encouraged to play acoustic guitar classical guitar at primary school um and i kept that up for about six months um and, and hated it like i was i got my my teacher made me go along to like a a recital above a pub in the next village over and, and play green sleeves and i remember so i think i'm pretty sure i played almost all the right notes but just they were not connected to each other in any way whatsoever <laughs> because the end of it, it was just like silence it's like no i'm not not into this <laughs> and so I left it so that was from the age sort of 10 10 11 um and then as a sort of um became a teenager and um and sort of got back into um the alternative kind of indie scene in the uk in particular so the the enemy was the sort of the magazine that was that was my bible so the, the new musical express um and the more obscure the band the better like if you knew who they were then i probably wasn't then at that point into them <laughs> we'd go and find someone else um but it was no it, it was guitar music it was definitely guitar music but it wasn't sort of um classic guitar music anyway. so it was it, w- it wasn't soloing it was a, a lot of sort of noise and sort of quite rudimentary playing but more about feel and impact and emotion than than, than sort of technicality so that that was where my background in terms of the, the music that the first sort of hooked me um came from um and yeah and then sort of at the age of 16 my I'd, I'd seen there was a band called jj72 which apparently stood for jam jars 72 which is ridiculous <laughs> um but they, they had a, a, a song called oxygen in which the the front man mark green he smashed his black strap i was like yeah that's that's cool <laughs> so I was a 15 year old but yeah and so I want to I want to play guitar again so my uncle plays and he gave me his um Honor Marlin so black black and white strap copy that everyone starts with sure. which was just a complete sort of dog um but that got me back into it um and then sort of went from there to sort of Epiphone Riviera and then and then on and on and on from that um so that that was me getting into music. It was just it was just falling in, in with like the bands that were in the enemy around that time, sort of early early two thousands, um, and and loving them, and then eventually sort of picking up the guitar to try and emulate what what they were doing, um, which is why it's sort of on a sort of slight tangent, but it's why it's amazing sort of working with someone like Josh from the Horrors, um, who's who's sort of one of our signature guys is is one of the, he's the guitarist from one of those bands that was around at that time and first got me into oh, wow. guitar playing so that's 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 a real big one for me to be able to uh, even sort of <laughs> speak to him occasionally <laughs> um but uh, to build a guitar for him is for some one of the guys that's sort of really got me into music in the first place is is great um so that yeah that's that's music and the guitar building um i sort of fiddled around with those guitars like the 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 honor got torn apart and chopped up and replaced I, I, it was a strat shape and i cut the horn off it with a wood saw in my parents garage i can remember to try and make it a telly <laughs> shape which so i decided i wanted a telly instead um so it's just a strat with a horn missing um and then i poured red paint onto the bit that had been cut off to make it look like it was like a wound <laughs> <laughs> like it had been wounded and so it had this like blood this red paint running down it like blood and i remember dad looked at it and he said, what are, what are you doing <laughs> like, he was he was right it looked ridiculous but um so it was that that was sort of the first one and then the the riviera pickups came out of it everything came off of that all the hardware so we we'll always fiddle around with them but I hadn't really got into luthiery or sort of the craft of it at all um until basically the year before i started the the business so i was, I was working in marketing for a, a decade um before i started before i started fidelity guitars um sort of planning ad campaigns and and for clients um and, and made sort of a good career out of it from from sort of shop floor up to sort of boardroom of a, a small agency um but it got to the point where it just it just made me really sad <laughs> it, was, <laughs> like it was um it wasn't fun to turn up every day um, and sort of started suffering with like, anxiety issues around sort of speaking in public and that. And it's like this, this, this doesn't, there's clearly something about this that doesn't sort of work for me. And at, at that point, I sort of started looking into what, what else could I do? Um, and I'd, when I went to university after school, I dropped out of a, a aerospace systems engineering degree. So basically an avionics degree that I did two years of and then, and then went snowboarding instead of doing the final year. So I had a bit of, um, 
engineering background there and obviously love guitars and thought maybe I can sort of mash these together because I'm fairly, fairly practical, sort of logical, mathematical person. So I thought I can apply that to, to this. Um, and bought first tool I ever bought was a X carve CNC. So from Invencible, so like a $1,500 yeah. CNC machine you, you built from a box. So that was, that was my first luthery tool was a, was a computer controlled that's router. A big, that's a big jump. Yeah, it's a big job. <laughs> yeah, no, no chisels, none of that, <laughs> no sandpaper. I uh, got that. Found a guy who had an old plant nursery that was crumbling in his back garden that rented me sort of a corner of his barn for ten ten pounds a week, um, and, and went in there and started trying to make stuff. Like drew drew some designs on CAD. Like drew drew boxes that were the same size as the guitars that I, I loved, and tried to fit some new curves inside that, um, and then and then started sort of cutting so i had a year where i was on my notice from my old career um where in my spare time i I learned how to do it and then january 2017 um went from within one month of being a marketeer um to being a like professional (laughs) luthier without any experience of actually making real experience of making or selling guitars so yeah it was a bit um both feet um so in at the deep end but that's that's kind of how like my head works if if i don't commit to doing something and, and kind of take the safety net away then then i'll i, I won't commit to it and i'll and i'll find like oh, okay, oh, i can i'll do this yeah. just in case as a backup and wouldn't have wouldn't have pushed it through sort of the hard points over the last few years to, to keep it going and keep it growing so and, and glad yeah glad that as hard as it's been at times sort of over that period glad glad that i did to, to get to the point now where we've got sort of a a, a pretty full order book and, and sort of sustainable income stuff and and yeah it's it's it's, it's a it's a thing it's it's That's now so wild job, that is absolutely because like yeah, it's pretty pretty dumb right <laughs> <laughs> well i mean you 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 did something you found something you love doing and you took a leap on it and i mean if you really think about it the worst case scenario was a few years down the line it didn't work and you do something else, but like you yeah. took away the option to you. This has to work. That you've got to make this work, and sometimes that's absolutely what you have to do uh, to to get that kind of uh, that push to finish something. You have to give yourself an ultimatum. And now you're doing pretty. How many guitars do you build, say, a month? Uh, so the the aim for sort of it, it fluctuates because it's do it in batches. So some months seem seem quite quiet while sort of sure. whole batches go through. But I think we built just over thirty guitars last year, and the aim is to build over fifty this year. Oh wow! Um, yeah, that and is yeah. At the moment, it's just me with the, was... with occasional bit of help and some sort of very kind um, sort of apprentices that that chip in occasionally. But um, yeah. that's what I was going to ask next. Is it still just you? so uh yeah yeah pretty much it's me and i um, just moved into uh a new space with um with another luthier local luthier who i've known for a little while um who is genuinely sort of a master trained luthier he builds acoustics so his, his name's jamie swan also we're, we're sharing a space but not sort of not we're not running the same business at the moment he's, he's yeah. doing his thing and i'm doing mine but um but yeah so it kind of moving towards the point where I think let's try and get some more people into help at, at some point in the near future. Oh, that'll be awesome. And of course, you know, that, that just helps, especially as orders start to back up on you and you're like, okay, no, I'm at a point where I need to be able to put a little more out a little quicker. Yeah, no, that's it. And I mean, that's, that, that's the pressure and it's, and it's kind of self-imposed to an extent because you, you give people a, a rough timeline on, on how long it takes to build. Um, and it inevitably takes a bit longer. Yeah, at the moment it's taking quite quite a lot longer than some of those orders from a while ago. So we've we've adjusted sort of our our predicted build times to be a bit more realistic based on sort of current scenario. But that's that's the main pressure. It's kind of not wanting to 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 let people down because I know what it'd be like to be in the the opposite situation. Um, but like I said, yeah, it's just it's growing pains. It's the nature of sort of running a, a small business and and trying to sort of push it one step at a time and, and grow it so if that if that's the main pressure i've got to live with is my sort of own self-imposed <laughs> um deadlines and, and and people's um sort of desire to get the guitar as soon as possible then i can i can live with that and frank thankfully everyone is being very sort of gracious about it and and, and understanding and, and just excited to, to sort of be part of it which is which is amazing that is incredibly cool and i don't know i did there's just I, I love the fact that you're out here doing it. You've got this idea, you've got this vision and it's, 
it, uh, based on what you've told me was the vision, it you're very much nailing it. Your va- that aesthetic is insane. Like I said, I haven't gotten to hold one yet. It's gonna happen one of these days. I'm gonna, yeah, we'll, we'll work that out. We'll sort that out. Yeah, we're gonna sort that out. I've got I've <laughs> got to get one in my hands and try it. And um, I think I think there's a a market too amongst uh, that that uh, <laughs> all I know so many. Um, blues and roots musicians who there's there's a there's a market there as well of guys who are just gonna lose their minds when they do finally <laughs> see these guitars because there I I know a guy actually uh, Eric Deaton I had him on the podcast a while back um, incredible roots hill country blues guitarist he's played on he's played on tracks with Dan Auerbach of the Black Keys you know he actually he played on the new album. Uh, uh, Delta Cream, I think, is the name of the new uh, Black Keys album. Which actually, you know, they came down to Mississippi to shoot some stuff for for photography and video, and maybe even to do some of the recording. But like that whole scene, the Burnsides and the um, Eric Deaton and all of the uh, oh, people are gonna be so Kimbros. Like that whole hit. <laughs> sorry, people are gonna be so mad. At me. I'm sorry, man, you, you forgot me. You, yeah. Um, yeah. That whole hill country scene, these guitars would wreck their world, like because they've got that aesthetic <laughs> that they love, but they're not constantly from gig to gig, not knowing if that guitar is going to play good enough to get them through the gig. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Eric plays an old, I think it's a Tysco. Don't quote me. He he said it on the the podcast. So y'all listeners, go back and listen. You'll figure out what it was. But it's it's an immaculate condition. It plays great. But someday it might not, because that's just yeah. the nature of those those guitars that came out in in the '60s, you know. And you mentioned Italian brands. I I always forget completely about the Italian brands that were putting out these funky, crazy, cool guitars too. Um, yeah, and like Eastern European and Soviet stuff as well. Like there's some crazy stuff out there. It's it's wild. Um, so I'm really excited to see somebody sort of taking it up and doing something original around it instead of just and not. I'm not shitting on uh, Eastwood or any of those that they're doing. It's great that those are available for people to get those airline style guitars and those Tysco style guitars. And even a couple of Dan Electro models that Dan Electro doesn't make anymore. I think Eastwood's making a couple of those. It's great yeah, that they're to be, around. To be fair, the, the, the price that they're doing them at is, is, is great. I mean, they're never going to be the best thing in the world, but no. to get hold of something sort of fairly unique that, that you can, can't get anywhere else. Like, yeah, it's, yeah, I love what they're doing, especially stuff with um, like Warren Ellis, like the, the tenor, yeah. I think it was a tenor guitar, maybe and a baritone maybe. They, they did they a did tenor, him, so, I know. Yeah. It was super yeah. cool. Uh, Emily Harris has one or had one. I don't know if she still does, but yeah, that super cool guitars. But we need other people making new stuff, like new ideas around it. Because um, so you see somebody playing uh, one of your guitars, they're, they're, it's not going to be like anything anybody else is out there playing. It's like when I show up to gigs with my Novo. Um, a lot of people go, I've never seen that before. What is that? You know? And so yeah. there's something cool about that that really appeals to the aesthetic lover in me. It's like, uh, yeah, definitely. No, it's, it, it's, yeah, it's, it, I don't think it's an ego thing. It's just part of it is just wanting to share that stuff with, with other, particularly other, other players, isn't it? Yeah. Like, it, it's exciting. It's exciting I, when you see something you've never seen before. Like, I've not met a player, uh, another guitar player or musician that has asked me about my Novo that I didn't put it in their hands. I'm like, here, this, this, check this out. And, you know, it's like, it's not about, oh, I've got this crazy, you know, not, you know, this custom shop thing. No, it's like, hey, this is awesome. You should also experience this awesome thing. Like, and so that's what I do. I've, 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 I've gone and gotten it for players just like, oh, no, here, play, try this out. Yeah, and the cool thing on that is that, like, like you say, it's not like you hand someone a, a telly and it might be like your favorite telly or have certain things about it unique, but they're, they're instantly going to be comparing it to all the other tellys they've played. It's, yeah. going, oh, it's good for this, it's, it's not as good as this one in this way and stuff, where you hand some, some, someone something completely unique and it kind of just takes all that away yeah. and you just you just play. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. Which is, which is amazing to be able to see that. I love it. Um I'm going to back up for a fun thought, though. You're talking about band names and ridiculous band names. Uh, it's like, uh, it kind of reminded me of when I was in college, uh, we had this, um, in Cleveland, we had this frame shop. Uh, and the daughter of the frame shop owner 
and their friends would gather in the like back alley part. It was it was enclosed, but it was just the back part of the shop that wasn't used for anything. It was essentially a bricked in alley. And they would have these like hardcore DIY shows back there on this like crazy, like carpeted stage that like was just, I don't know, it was like two by two foot blocks that were just pushed, pushed all together. And they would have these DIY uh, punk shows, hardcore shows, screen core shows. And a buddy of mine was in a band too. He's in two of my favorite band names of all time. One was Sugar Biscuit. Um, which was an all girl hardcore band, except for him. He was the guitarist. Um, <laughs> and, uh, he actually played my favorite guitar solo of all time. And it was the anti guitar solo. He, um, <laughs> <laughs> there's this one part in the song and like they're a hardcore band. It's notoriously non guitar solo, right? Notoriously just chugged out chords and screaming lyrics. And it was great and just violent and unruly, but they were writing this one song and they're like, Oh shit, this needs a guitar solo. And so his solo is literally just moving his hands on the fretboard just randomly and strumming the strings and just like <laughs> noise, just muted, yeah. scraped. No- and it's so perfect. It is yeah, so amazing. Absolutely that, that, is right what that, song- that sounds perfect. Yeah, it's so <laughs> what that song needed. But my other one, the most ridiculous band name was Love Zombie. And all of their songs were about love, zombies, or zombies in love. And, <laughs> and I, I love that kind of thing. I love those kind of bands that are just quirky. They'll, n- they'll never be popular, but they've got yeah, their... You're, you're probably only getting one album out of that, but it's going to be a great album. Hey, yeah. They had a song <laughs> they called Walking to Japan that came about over like a drunken conversation about the fact that zombies didn't need to breathe. So theoretically, they could walk <laughs> to Japan across the bottom of the ocean. So they wrote us. It's like this is so ridiculous and amazing and beautiful, and that's what I love about music. And so, yeah, but I, I bet it was amazing fun to be in that band, oh, and that's kind of the point. So, <laughs> yeah, it it's crazy. Uh, both of those bands, my buddy played guitar in Sugar Biscuits. He played keyboard in uh, Love Zombie. He was actually a bassist. I I never saw him playing bass, but that's always his main instrument was bass. So, um, but oh, it's it's. I'm gonna track down some Sugar Biscuit now. There was there was a pop band. I, I don't know if they were popular in the US, but I'm um, called Sugar Babes in the late '90s, early noughties, like go go trio, but like very pop. Um, so it, it makes me think of maybe like Limp Biscuit playing Sugar Babes songs <laughs> and that's I mean, something i want to hear i really I, want to hear that yeah no, they it sounds like it'd be awesome <laughs> no sugar biscuits was it was a band formed uh over a couple of uh, as they told the story uh a couple of lunches at like the local chinese food buffet restaurant and they needed a band name and they were eating the sugar biscuits at the chinese restaurant and okay and just just where the name came out of and so that's where the legend began yeah exactly you know it's it's fantastic i, I kind of miss that scene um and I, I i told this story on a previous podcast but that um that ended the whole alley behind the shop ended when the I did hear that. Yeah, yeah this is the, the tax I, issues. Yeah, yeah, IRS. So <laughs> then it became farmhouse and house shows and all sorts of other cool stuff happening there. And so it became this really cool community that has since vanished. I don't know that anything like that's happening anywhere in Mississippi anymore, but it is what it is. You know, it was great while I was in college. I was glad it was happening while I was there. Um, <laughs> but so uh, I really appreciate you coming on, Matt, and spending time with me. Uh, no, it's listen- a pleasure, man. Could happily um, carry on for another hour. It's, oh yeah, yeah. it's good to talk. Oh, we, there's absolutely more we could talk about. And listeners, we are going to carry on a little more on the Patreon exclusive content. So, if you are interested in hearing uh, more from Matt and myself, uh, you can go over to Patreon.com/slash Forty Watt Podcast uh, for five dollars a month. You will get extra content. Every week, I can't promise how much. It could be a half hour. It could be three and a half hours. Who knows? You got to go over there to find out. So I really appreciate y'all hanging out, listening, watching. If you are on YouTube, I appreciate it. Um, We're going to mosey on. We're going to get over to the other content. And uh, I want you to make sure you like, subscribe. This is the part I hate, y'all. This is why I'm so bad at this. Like, y'all do the thing on the social media. The the thing with the stuff. Share 
share with your friends, tell friends about it, and uh, we're going to catch you later. But until then, um, be good to yourselves, be kind to each other, and try to make some noise. Peace. This episode is brought to you by the supporters of 40 Watt Podcast over on Patreon. Go over to patreon.com slash 40 Watt Podcast, where for as little as $3 per month, you can help support the podcast and get every episode ad-free. For $5 a month, you'll get every episode ad-free, as well as a bonus episode every week. I can't overstate how thankful I am for the support of my patrons, and hope you'll consider joining the team and helping keep this show on the road.